want to invite you to turn with me to Revelation uh, chapter 1, verse 1, and Mike Plucker will be reading it today. So Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 8 is what I have. Yeah. <laughs> the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it because the time is near. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be the kingdom, to be a kingdom and priests, to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the people of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Thank you, Mike. Would you join me as we ask a blessing on Pastor Mark this morning? Lord, Heavenly Father, we just lift up Pastor Mark before you this morning. Just fill him with your Holy Spirit, Lord, that he may have the words to say. And just step aside and let you step through him, Lord, as he brings the message this morning. Just bless us as we hear this message. And may it be something we can apply to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are on our 96th sermon in this sermon series. Uh, on some of my groups of pastors, they'll be like, what's the longest sermon series that you've done? I'm like, hold on for this one. A hundred, you know. Um, and so we're on 96. That means we're coming in for the landing here. And so we're in the book of Revelation. For those of you that are uh, just love the book of Revelation and dive into it all the time. You may be a little disappointed in this part of the sermon series. We're not going to dive real deep into it, but give a cursory view. And then hopefully at some point in the near future, I'll come back and preach a series on it. Because it really takes more than five sermons uh, to cover the book of Revelation, right? And so uh, I'll start here with our key question. So today, it's just the first chapter I'm going to be looking at. So what can we learn from the opening of the book of Revelation? Our key idea, this is what we're going to learn. Uh, John's walk with the Lord, who Jesus is, and how the book was created are all discussed. In that first chapter, really, that's what John is doing. He's setting the tone for the rest of the book. The key scriptures from 1, 10, and 11. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet, saying, Write in a book what you see, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, and to Smyrna, and to Pergamum, Pergamum and to Thyatira, to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. And so that uh, is... Uh, our key verse today. So the book of Revelation is, uh, first of all, note that it's one revelation, right? Um, it's, you often hear it's the book of Revelations. No, it's one revelation. And so uh, remember that. Uh, the uh, other thing is that it was written by John. Remember, John was one of Jesus' inner circle, uh, Peter, James, and John. Uh, John was one of them that uh, Jesus just poured his life into. But before we dive too much further into this opening chapter, um, I want you to think about uh, a couple of things. And um, in Gettysburg, 
Did you think I was going to Gettysburg? It's in Pennsylvania. Well, in Gettysburg, they have a museum. And in the museum, they have an old technology called a cyclorama. And a cyclorama is a 360 degree uh, picture, if you will. And of course, theirs is from um, the actual battle. Um, and the way it was, it's described is, is it was must-see entertainment of the 1880s. This idea of a 360-degree picture. They were kind of the blockbuster movies of the time because it was before m motion pictures, right? And they depicted epic battles and scenes or of historical places. They were enormous. Some would be four stories high and they were painted on canvas and they encompassed a room and completely surrounding and then they would maybe have something playing in the background or, or people talking. Um, and it was created by a French artist. I, I can't pronounce the name, but it's uh, Paul Philip Philippeteau something like that, um, and it was created in 1884. And so this particular one was of Pickett's charge during the third day of battle. And the reviews come out and they were saying it's marvelous, it's spectacular, this cyclorama. And the painting survived in an exhibition for many, many years. And it kind of got passed through different things and it got ripped, it got torn, it got faded. And uh, it eventually was donated to Gettysburg and they built this whole room for it. And it really is magnificent and it's um, over 140 years old and people still say, you've got to see the cyclorama. And you can see all the different parts of the battle throughout and it's, it's a pretty massive painting. So, in modern day, we have something similar called the IMAX theater. You know, one time uh, we had an IMAX theater and it was in the middle of uh, an amusement park and uh, we used to be part of a, a church group that uh, would rent it out, this amusement park from, I think, seven at night to like six in the morning that we would be able to ride any ride we wanted and everything. And so I went and I rode everything. I went upside down. I went sideways. I went every which way. And then I went into the IMAX theater. They were like, oh, it's, it's super hot out here. Let's go into the IMAX and cool off. And I'm like, yeah, after what I've been through, this should be easy. So I go in there and I get sick from the IMAX theater. The IMAX theater is above you and, and it, Imagine it, it, it covers all your peripherals, right? Uh, above you, down below you, and to each side. And, and the la it's loud. There's all sorts of music and noises. And, and the picture is just moving. And it's really cool. But man, I got motion sickness, something fierce there. And so I had to just close my eyes. The reason I'm telling you all this, the cyclorama, the IMAX, I, I heard it described as John receiving a vision that's essentially like the IMAX or like the cyclorama. That no matter where he turned on this little island, that he could see the vision. And all he saw was, he, he saw something and he didn't necessarily understand it. And so he would describe it, if, if you read the book, pay attention to uh, the word like. So often the word like is in it because he would see a picture and, and he would say, well, it's like this, right? Um, he's describing this most magnificent vision that probably anyone has ever seen. And he's trying to write it down and describe to us and to the seven churches uh, what this vision was like. And it was maybe like a cyclorama. Maybe it was like an IMAX theater. It probably had sights and sounds and maybe even smells that he could do. And so he did his very best to write it down so that we would understand the vision that he saw. 
And so he starts off the book of Revelation. He says the revelation of Jesus Christ. He starts off by laying the foundation. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's the foundation for the whole book. Which gave him to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant, John, who testified the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ even to all that he saw. So here's the steps of revelation that he just got done telling us. This is how he received the revelation. It was God to Jesus, to an angel, to John, for the purpose of sending it out to the ministry servants. And so that's how we receive the message today. And so it was communicated by an angel to his bondservant who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ of all that he saw. Now in verse 3, I think this blessing may uh, apply to us. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it for the time is near. It's interesting, the time is near. This was written 2,000 years ago. It seems like every generation, the book of Revelation was written so that we would assume that Jesus was coming back in our time frame. And so I took a class on the book of Revelation, and I, I raised my hand at one point, and I said, what is the purpose of the book of Revelation? If It it was written in a genre that we no longer have. You cannot go into Barnes and Noble and say, you know, may I see the Apocrypha um, section of Scripture, right? Or of, of the books. We don't have that genre. We don't even understand it completely. And so it's written in a way that we don't even necessarily understand. And we have to really, really study it to even comprehend what it's talking about. And, and so it has this literature. So I, I asked the professor, why was it written? Because if we always think Jesus is coming back in our generation, at some point he is, and it says here that 2,000 years ago, even John said the time is near. And he said, the book of Revelation was written as a radical call to discipleship. Jesus is coming back this we know our job is to be ready as your pastor my job is to make sure you're one of the ones captured in the air that you're ready for jesus second coming and so um it's it should spur us to want uh, to live our life as a christian And so, you know, technically, the end times began when Jesus went back into heaven. Like, that was technically the start of the end times. And so in verse 4, he says, John to the seven churches that are in Asia. So he's writing uh, this specifically to the seven churches. And so you're going to hear the term seven, well, the number seven, Uh, throughout the book of revelation seven means complete there it's a completeness when you hear seven it's considered complete and so uh, you may say well how are the churches then complete and in this case it's literally seven churches but it's also seven churches because it it covers so many types of churches and so in a lot of ways you will find your church in one of those seven. And the church down the road will be able to identify with one of those seven. It's, it's the completeness of the church. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. Do you hear eternity in that sentence? Do you understand how magnificent God is? God is who is, who was, and is to come. Past, 
present, and future. That's who we're dealing with. And the seven spirits. Again, seven is complete. You say, what are the seven spirits? Well, it, it's the complete spirit. That's the Holy Spirit who are before His throne. And from Jesus Christ, there's the foundation. And he goes on to give us some titles of Jesus here. The faithful witness. The firstborn of the dead. He, he was raised from the dead. He was resurrected from the dead. And the ruler of the kings of the earth. He's the king of kings. And there he is described as prophet, priest, and king. In the Old Testament, there were three different titles, three different people that worked together for the good of God, or at least they were supposed to. The king ruled, but he listened to a prophet who, who was saying what was going to happen. And then he listened to the priest, and the priest would um, be there on behalf of the king, and he would offer the sacrifices of the people so that their sins could be atoned for. And here, it says Jesus is prophet, priest, and king. And then it says, to him who loves us. What a powerful reminder. He loves us. And released us from our sins by his blood. And he's made us to be a kingdom, the kingdom of God, priests to his God and Father, to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Jesus is not only the dominion, he is the amen. Behold, he's coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him and the tribes of the earth will mourn over him so it is to be amen that's what amen means so it is to be so be it and here he jesus is the very amen and this he is coming in the clouds that's after the capture of the church that is uh when he comes to reign as king of kings on the earth and then, this is Jesus speaking, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Two Greek letters that are situated at the beginning of the alphabet and the end of the alphabet. He's the first and the last. He always has been. That also draws imagery to the alphabet, right? From Alpha to Omega. And he was the very Word of God. He's described in Scripture as the Word. And who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. There He is. Always has been and always will be. So then he, John gets into his vision. And he uh, describes a little bit about who he is too. I, John, your brother and fellow partaker of in the tribulation. That is, here he was um, doing God's work and he was being persecuted because of it. In the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance, which are in Jesus, was the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. He was put on this island. He was secluded out. It kind of reminds me of uh, when I was a kid, I always heard that, that Russia would send some of their spies and things that were caught way off into Siberia, right? Into the frozen tundra. Here he was cast off to this island of Patmos and there he was to serve out his term almost like under house arrest on this island. And, and it was there that he received the vision, and he was there because he was serving the Lord. In verse 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. There he was worshiping. What else are you going to do on an island, right? You're going to worship. And he was worshiping the, 
on the Lord's day that day, and he heard behind him a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet. It wasn't a trumpet. It was a sound and a voice like a trumpet. I wonder how that voice would have actually sounded. We know it was probably booming, wasn't it? And I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet saying, write in the book what you see and send it to the seven churches. Uh, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Ber Pergamum, Pergamum and to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet. So there it was, there were seven lampstands in a circle, and in the middle was the Son of Man. And girded across his chest with a golden sash, his head and his hair were white like wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. And so that is telling us, uh, giving us the imagery of ancient of days or of an eternal existence. He's got this white hair. And his eyes were like a flame of fire and his feet were like burnished bronze. This brass or burnished bronze uh, is a symbol of judgment. And when it has been made to glow in a furnace in his Voice was like the sound of many waters, like rushing waters. And this is a voice of authority coming in. And then his right hand, he held seven stars and out of his mouth came a sharp two edged sword. We know that the Bible describes itself as a as sharp as a two edged sword. It's like a doctor's scalpel. And his face was like the sun shining in its strength. You know you can't look into the sun without damaging your eyes. And so it is with God and with Jesus. You couldn't look into his eyes because of the strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. I've said when we get to heaven, that's what we may be like. All we're going to know is to worship. And we're going to fall at Jesus' feet. And that's what he did. He fell at his feet and he placed his right hand on me saying, do not be afraid. W what an important line. Because he was afraid. He was on this island. He was seeing this vision and he sees Jesus in the middle of these lampstands and he falls at his feet and he's trembling. I'm the first and the last, the alpha, the omega, and the living one. He was the resurrected one. And I was dead and behold, I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and of Hades. He conquered death itself and he held the keys. Not only did he have the keys to the kingdom, he had the keys to death itself. Therefore, write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after these things. As for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Ultimately, Christ is in control. And he holds the control. Now in coming weeks, we'll cover uh, some of the other chapters. And, and the first, I think, four chapters are the here and now. And then after, it starts looking into the future. So if we go back and we set the stage, we set uh, understanding who Jesus is, he lists that, first of all, he's the faithful witness. Second is that he was the firstborn of the dead. He conquered death itself. He's 
resurrected. Jesus is also the ruler of the earth. He's in charge. And John also described him as him who loved us. How much did he love us? He died for our sins on the cross. Jesus loved us. He was one that washed us in the blood. This imagery uh, for people that are unaccustomed to hearing about Jesus' death and that his death and his blood saved us. It was his atoning sacrifice for us. And so somehow we can be washed as white as snow and yet washed in the blood. That's at times can be uncomfortable to even think about, but it was Jesus' blood that washed us clean. The, he established the kingdom of priests, that he's the king, he's the priest of all priests. And ultimately, to him be the glory, that he is the final amen. So John sets the stage, he says, this is the foundation of my book, this is the foundation of my vision. And then he gives us clues to his own faith. And that's what I want to draw on today. First, it says that he was devoted to worship. When he received this vision, he was in the midst of worship that day. And so in verse 10, it says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. He was worshiping God. There's at times that uh, in my life I don't know what else to do but to worship. There's times when I just can't get in my mind what the sermon's going to be like and I turn to worship and it's amazing what God will do in the midst of worship. Second, we know that John was obedient to the word. He wrote down this vision. He was obedient to the word. In verse 2 he says, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he had saw. He testified and he was so faithful and obedient to Christ that he was persecuted for it. We also know that he was focused on Jesus in both his testimony and his witness to Christ. Uh, but also, he said in verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. And then we know that he embraced the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came to him in worship and he embraced the Spirit. He embraced the vision and he wrote it down. And then we know that he endured suffering. That he was a fellow partaker in the tribulation and the kingdom and the perseverance which are in Jesus. So we learned about Jesus and we learned about John. So what do we do with that information? Again, the book of Revelation was written so that we're ready. That we should be called to discipleship. And so... The first question is, how might you worship differently? How might you get into the mode of worship? So often we think of worship as this hour, hour and a half, two hours, no, uh, on a Sunday morning. But we know that worship should and can extend well beyond the four walls. So how might you worship differently from now on? How might you be more focused on Christ and obedience to His Word? Learning the biblical principles, things in the Bible. There's times where I'll find myself and I'll be like, how did I get here in life? And it's from me going against principles that I know are right. The biblical principles. So how might you be more focused on Jesus and being obedient to his word? How might you embrace the Holy Spirit? 
We talked a little bit about that in previous weeks. By being assured of your faith and letting the Holy Spirit do a work in you. Remember, Jesus promised us the Holy Spirit as a gift that would be far more powerful than Him. And then last, how might you grow from your suffering? Our suffering looks different than anybody else's. It's unique to us and our circumstances. And I've talked about that extensively over the past weeks. About how we're not supposed to let our suffering go to waste. That we use it and we grow from it. And let it strengthen our faith going forward. God allows us to experience it, absolutely. But it's for our own strength and for our uh, faith that ultimately we understand that we can conquer anything. I want to invite the singers or singer singers up. And we'll sing our hymn of invitation. This time is open. If you need prayer for anything, come, let me pray with you. If you come in with a burden, you're suffering, or maybe you want to, to grow deeper in the Lord, come, let me pray with you. Maybe you've never accepted Christ to start off.